I think I'm listening. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today for the um, our first scientific director lecture series on cancer research, uh, uh, Jeff Train. Our speaker today is Todd Gallup uh, of the Broad Institute. He is a director and founding core member of Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Uh, he's a world leader in using a uh, genomics tool to understand the basis of cancer. And he pioneered the development of new cell-based approach for drug discovery uh, in cancer and other diseases. Third is the, is the uh, Charles A. Diner investigator in human cancer uh, genetics at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and professor of pediatrics of Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is the recipient of multiple awards, uh, including the Outstanding Achievement Award from the American Association for Cancer Research, uh, the uh, Paul Max uh, Prize for Cancer Research from Memorial Sloan Cancer, uh, cancer uh, Center, and the Dal Dan Dan Land Prize uh, from the American Physiology Society. Uh, and in, 2020, in 2014, he was um, elected to the National Academy of Medicine. So please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Dr. Gallup uh, to give uh, uh, Jeff Trent a lecture on cancer research. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me uh, back to NHGRI. It's great to be back, and I have to say especially uh, an honor to give the Jeff Trent uh, lecture. Um, Jeff Trent is one of those real pioneers of what we now call cancer genomics as a field, uh, but Jeff really should be credited with some of those earliest ideas um, for how genetics and genomics might impact not only the cancer research community, but, but impact uh, patients suffering from cancer. So it's really uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, first, uh, a few disclosures. Um, I've had the privilege of helping to uh, advise a number of biotech uh, companies, and we have um, some sponsored research funding from a couple of companies. Um, so this is, I think for most people in the cancer field, take a slide like this for granted now. It's kind of the rubric for how we think about cancer precision medicine, and that is that a patient's journey would start with a sample of a tumor that would then be genomically characterized, and by uh, tumor genome here, I mean not just the sequence of the, of the tumor, but other molecular characteristics, expression, proteomics, um, what have you, and based on that omic characterization, one would develop insights that would then lead to the selection of appropriate therapy, which targeted therapy, which would then uh, lead hopefully not just to an initial transient response, but to durable um, responses that, that really uh, improve quality and duration of life for those patients. Does everybody with cancer in 2023 benefit from this paradigm? Absolutely not. It's still the minority, I think it's fair to say. But I don't think it's a wrong idea simply because everyone today doesn't benefit from it. It's the right idea. I think there's no going back. It just means there's a lot of work to do. And I'll tell you a little bit about what our lab and others at the Broad are thinking about to try to make this a reality for more and more patients. I want to start just for fun with sort of where I started in this field as a pediatric oncology fellow, as a, as a postdoc. Um, where I actually studied one of my own first patients as a pediatric oncologist, um, a kid with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and based on the genomic methods of the time, uh, discovered uh, a new chromosome translocation, including a new gene, now known as ETV6, which this was pre-genome uh, sequencing era, and so you could discover genes past, uh, back then. Um, discovered this gene fusion as a result of a cryptic chromosome translocation, a 1221 translocation. This fusion um, turns out in follow-up work to remain the most common uh, gene fusion or chromosome translocation in childhood uh, ALL. And it also turns out that the prognosis of those patients, those kids given standard chemotherapy is extraordinary. Well north of 90% cures um, given chemotherapy and that's allowed 
um, clinicians to now scale back the intensity of therapy for those patients if you're positive for this particular gene fusion. And that's important for kids where giving cytotoxic chemotherapy has quite substantial long-term side effects. So I think that's all good, and I'm, I'm proud of that initial discovery, which was now almost 30 years ago. I will note that just the year prior to this, another important leukemia discovery uh, was made by Paul Yu and Francis Collins, discovering a translocation involving another component of this so-called core binding factor uh, complex, um, which made this even more interesting because it was clear that there was selection for rearrangements of this, of this gene family. So then both these discoveries about 30 years ago. And so I think we have to ask the hard question of, you know, is this a, a, a victory uh, for precision medicine? On the one hand, it is because there's dose escalation for these um, uh, kids with this particular uh, gene fusion. But on the other hand, we're 30 years in, and as far as I'm aware, there are zero drugs in development, um, serious development in the industry to go after this fusion. And I think that's largely, it's not just because it's relatively uncommon childhood cancer where the commercial opportunity is large, but it's also because this involves the fusion of two transcription factors and transcription factors being largely relegated to the so-called undruggable class of proteins, unlike enzymes, for example, that are more straightforward um, to target with, with small molecules. I think if we're really serious about precision medicine, not just for oncology, but in general, we need to get more serious about making it possible to develop therapeutics that target whatever the genome is providing. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about this towards the end of my talk. So what are some of the approaches that we can take to approach cancer discovery from a cancer precision medicine perspective? The two obvious ways are to learn from patients and to learn from experiments in the lab. And I would say that people tend to have like bordering on religious views on which of uh, these approaches are more important. The argument in favor of learning from patients is of course they're patients and there's nothing more physiologically relevant than a patient suffering, suffering from cancer. Um, that's good, but the challenge there of course is that there's a limit to the there's probably no limit to the types of observations you can do in, in patients or in materials obtained from patients, but there is a limit to what you can do in terms of perturbations. That is, you know, clinical trials, which for any one patient will be limited in, in number, and then following patients in the routine clinical care. On the other side of the coin, we can learn from experiments in the lab, for example, cell lines growing in petri dishes. There you can do an infinite number of perturbational experiments which is how we learn best in general, but they suffer from their cell lines growing in plastic and they're not real tumors and real people. So I think rather than sort of arguing about these two, the, the, the goal really needs to be to take both approaches and I'll give and integrate them together and I'll give some examples of, of how we're trying to do that. First, starting and learning from patients and of course, um, it's fun to give this talk at the NHGRI because you know, possibly the single the project that wound up having the single uh, biggest impact on the field of cancer research in recent memory was the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, project, which is a collaboration between NHGRI and NCI. This was a big bet for NCI, a really big bet for NHGRI relative to the overall budget. Um, but this just changed the way I think the whole field thinks about the role of the genome in cancer in a way that there's just knowing back. That had a follow-up um, international uh, cancer genome project, the IGC, uh, ICGC. And now I would, uh, it, it's fair to say that cancer genome testing has become commonplace and standard of care uh, throughout this country and, and many other countries, of course, largely happening um, in commercial uh, testing uh, settings in companies that are doing uh, panel testing of 300 or 400 genes, increasing number of, of companies tech, uh, sequencing the entirety of the exome in tumors. So such that in the US alone, there are now hundreds of thousands of patients that are having their tumors sequenced in companies. Um, and that's great and can be useful for those patients. 
But I want to flag that I think a real challenge here is that we're not learning as much as we can and should from that patient uh, experience. Most of the data that are generated by commercial uh, testing companies, where that testing is being done at very high quality, goes into a black hole and is not available to the re research community uh, to learn from. It's not that they're opposed to making the data available. It's not their mission to support uh, research. And I think this is, I'll come back to this again, is something I think we need to worry about, not just in cancer, but beyond cancer, as increasingly genetic testing becomes routine um, and becomes the work of the commercial world, how do we nevertheless learn from it among the, the research uh, community? I want to say a little bit about direct-to-patient efforts, because uh, in addition to the large academic uh, medical center uh, uh, ways of, of um, focused mechanisms for uh, doing cancer genome studies, or the commercial testing that I just mentioned, what about direct engagement of patients? And this is particularly important in, in oncology because, as you may know, uh, the majority of uh, patients with cancer in the U.S. are not treated at major research medical centers. They're treated by community oncologists. About 85% of those patients are, are treated in the community, and only a tiny sliver of patients actually are enrolled in in clinical trials, mostly at major medical centers, where there's a mechanism to ask patients whether they'd be interested in being study participants with informed consent and so on. And so most patients, cancer patients, are very interested and eager to participate as uh, partners in, in research, but most of them aren't asked because they're treated in the community by uh, busy practicing oncologists in, in private practice. And so the question was, could we connect with those patients directly using social media, not having to go through a major medical center, um, a research center, to obtain informed consent and obtain samples from patients. And so the goal of this initiative, which we've called Count Me In, or CMI, is to make it possible for any patient anywhere to contribute their genomic and clinical information uh, as partners in research, and to, again, use that uh, and to do that um, by using modern social media mechanisms to reach patients uh, and obtain uh, informed consent online. Um, so I'd like to give a couple of examples, and this is the work of Nick Wagley, who, who spearheaded um, the Count Me In initiative, initially focused on metastatic uh, breast cancer. As you may know, breast cancer was a big component of the TCGA, initial cancer genome analysis project. But that study focused on newly diagnosed, untreated patients, which was really important. But there were really no large-scale studies of metastatic breast cancer. And that's what, unfortunately, patients who die of breast cancer die of metastatic disease. And so the question here was, could we reach out into the community to um, obtain samples, um, do sequence analysis, and with patient provided clinical information, clinical follow-up information uh, for metastatic breast cancer, and the answer was yes. And so very quickly, the project was able to accumulate several thousand um, patients with metastatic breast cancer um, from all 50 states and, and parts of Canada, as shown on the left. Um, and interestingly, as shown on the right, with the size of these dots representing the number of patients that came from different centers, where a center may be a uh, practicing oncologist in the community, most of these patients came from different treatment facilities, most with an N of one patient from that one uh, practice. Over 1,600 different practices represented um, in, this, um, in this study. So I think that's really interesting and encouraging. I will say that um, with respect to this morning's discussion around the importance of diversity in genetic studies, this seems like it should be a mechanism to better engage uh, patients as partners in research across the, the diversity spectrum. That doesn't and has not happened automatically, simply by capturing all 50 states, since there's an active component of the Count Me In project that is specifically trying to engage um, underrepresented uh, patient populations. So metastatic breast cancer is, unfortunately, a common type of cancer. What about using the direct-to-patient approach to 
study rare cancers, where this might be even more useful because even the major academic medical centers don't see enough of rare tumor types to have a large experience. So uh, we um, initiated another project, this one uh, led by Corey Painter, uh, for a tumor called angiosarcoma, a rare uh, cancer with only about 300 cases uh, per year. Corey herself is a survivor of, of angiosarcoma, so she was a passionate champion of this project. And what was remarkable here is that despite the, this being super rare, because the patient communities were already connected, it was very easy to connect to them through social media. And we had about 300 patients within the first few months of, of this study, did genetic analysis of, of those tumors, together with the patient provided clinical information. And a couple of findings came out of that initial study, which was published in, in Nature Medicine. Um, again, led by Corey and, and uh, Nick Wagley. One was that, particularly for some of these patients, the number of mutations, somatic mutations, was quite high. The so-called tumor mutation burden was quite high in these angiosarcoma patients. And second, while the numbers were small, there were a couple of anecdotal responses of patients who had responded to immune checkpoint blockade therapy being given off-label. Um, enough of a signal there while it didn't reach statistical significance to say, oh, that kind of goes together, high mutational burden, response to checkpoint blockade, somebody should do a clinical trial in angiosarcoma testing immune checkpoint blockade. That study was done, we had nothing to do with it, it was reported at, at ASCO um, just uh, this summer showing quite substantial responses um, to immune checkpoint blockade. So I think this is exciting because it suggests that particularly for rare cancers, engaging patients wherever they are may be the most effective uh, way to do this type of uh, cancer genomics research. And beyond that, I think we're excited to be extending this count me in approach beyond rare cancers to rare non-cancers because it's the, um, to rare non-cancers uh, because um, those um, rare diseases of any kind no, even the large academic medical centers just don't see enough to have uh, enough experience. But if we could reach them anywhere in the country and um, eventually anywhere in the world, that could, we believe, accelerate uh, rare disease research quite uh, dramatically. And I should mention, of course, that um, as we do for all projects at the Broad, as these genomic data are generated, um, they're made available for the research community uh, to benefit from. So I think these kind of genomic studies are really powerful for a snapshot of um, analyzing the genomes of cancer, but you'd like to get more than a snapshot. And so this is, this is connecting to the prior session a bit um, because the revolution of blood biopsy um, methods, essentially the same kind of approaches as for NIPT, um, are becoming very exciting uh, in the world of, of oncology. And that is the ability to use, to look for circulating tumor DNA, uh, free DNA in the peripheral blood of patients, uh, either for screening or for um, following minimal residual disease or MRD response to therapy and then capturing a patient's recurrence before the tumor burden is so high that it's hard to get on top of it with salvage chemotherapy. Um, this works far better than I thought it ever would, and it's not just in our hands, but in, in multiple groups showing that this works. The sensitivity, though, is still a real problem. In the screening setting, sensitivity particularly to detect early stage tumors is quite low. Um, and in the recurrent setting, in the MRD setting, the ability to identify recurrences as early as you'd like is also limited. And so the question is, why is that? Is it a failure of the tests themselves, of the molecular biology you know, of the test, or is it something else? And we believe that it's actually something else that's as simple as there aren't enough molecules of the tumor-derived DNA in the tube of blood. If you estimate that there are, let's say, a billion cancer cells in a stage one cancer on average, plus or minus. And if you believe, as, as most people do, that most of the cell-free DNA in blood is coming from only the proportion of those um, cells that are dying, that's still about 10 to the seventh 
cells. If it's about, you say, a 1% dead or dying cells, that's still about 10 to the seventh cells. And yet, the estimates of the number of cell-free uh, or of tumor equivalents in a tube of blood that goes into um, blood biopsy tests, it's on the order of a cell or sometimes less than a cell in those MRD uh, kind of settings. And so the challenge is that if there aren't tumor-derived DNA molecules in the tube of blood, it doesn't matter how much you amplify the signal that's in the tube, you know, in whatever your test is, if there's no substrate there to begin with, you're out of luck. And so the question is, um, why does that happen? Um, it is likely the case that there's some tumor types that shed less of their tumor DNA from those dying cells into the blood. But we know that a lot of the reason there's so little circulating tumor DNA in the blood is because it's so rapidly clear, cleared, for example, by Kupfer cells, the macrophage-like cells in the liver. Um, and so if that's the case, this rapid clearance, um, is there anything you could do about this? And so I wanted to share uh, the work from the Gershner Center for Cancer Diagnos Diagnostics at the Broad Institute uh, in two projects led by Victor Adel Steinson, uh, one together uh, with Sangeeta Bhatia from MIT and one uh, from Chris Love also at MIT, um, trying to address this question of could you transiently pause this clearance of, of um, cell-free DNA by one of two strategies, either transiently occupy these Kupfer cells so they cannot as effectively engulf the cell-free DNA, or give individuals a monoclonal antibody directed against uh, DNA, thereby blocking it from um, this Kupfer cell-mediated um, uptake. And so this is, of course, just in animal studies, but in mouse models, bearing uh, um, xenograft, xenografted human tumors, um, they're able to show that, in fact, you can boost by 10 to 100-fold with either of these two strategies the amount of cell-free DNA that you can collect from the animals. That's a transient response. So the idea would be that, and we're interested in bringing this forward to patients in the future, could you give patients prior to their blood biopsy test, an injection of an agent like this, and then 30 or 60 minutes later, collect the regular tube of blood and do whatever standard downstream assay you'd like to do. So we'll see whether that uh, will work in patients, but I think looks encouraging um, uh, because the, the power of being able to detect cancer genomes in blood is pretty profound. And if we could optimize that even further, that would be a very good thing. Now, I want to turn to uh, from how we can learn from patients to how we can learn um, from experiments in the lab. And of course, I mean, a lot of things you can learn from laboratory studies, but here I mean primarily systematic um, genome scale types of, of studies that, that you're all uh, uh, very familiar with. Uh, so I want to um, say a little bit about a project that I'm particularly proud of um, at, at the Broad uh, that we call the Cancer Dependency Map, or DET Map uh, for short. And the concept here is simply to take a large number of patient-derived, human patient-derived cancer models, cell lines, and we now have more than a thousand of those that have been completely characterized, and by that I mean whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, uh, RNA-seq, uh, various degrees of epigenetic profiling, um, proteomic um, analysis, metabolite profiling. And then for each of those thousand cell lines, subject them to genome-wide CRISPR, Cas9, or in some cases Cas12, loss of function studies. Um, so from this matrix of a thousand cell lines, completely genomically characterized and systematically perturbed, knocking out every gene in the genome, you get a data ma matrix that allows you to create a map of cancer dependencies um, or um, vulnerabilities, where you know, obviously if you knock out a gene and none of the models care with respect to their survival, that's not very interesting. If you find something that kills everything, that's probably not interesting either, because that will be uh, something 
um, that's likely to just be toxic because it's a common essential uh, gene. But if you find knockouts that pr produce a selective vulnerability, that's the most interesting with respect to identifying a future therapeutic target. So again, the idea is a matrix of now over 100,000 molecular features for each of the 1,000 cell lines, um, a dependency profile based on either CRISPR knockout studies um, or systematic small molecule treatment as another form of perturbation. We've done a limited number of CRISPR activation studies to look at um, a gain of function across the genome, but not at depth map kind of scale, and then use what are pretty standard machine learning uh, approaches to find predictors of particular vulnerabilities. Um, the, all of these data are made publicly available and accessible through a, a quite useful um, portal uh, called the DETMAP portal. And I'm pleased that the usage of this is now become pretty ubiquitous in, in cancer labs, particularly in industry, where now I think pe when people are considering a therapeutic target, first thing they'll do is to say, well, okay, what does its pattern of vulnerability look like in the debt map? And if it shows no pattern of vulnerability, you know, you should probably think about other targets. I'll also just mention, but not go into detail, that there are a number of follow-on studies as part of the next generation of the debt map uh, project, uh, which is led, uh, important to say, by Paquita Vasquez, um, also with Bill Hahn and uh, Bill Sellers, and previously uh, Jesse Bohm. Um, new cancer models, patient-derived uh, models, particularly focusing on those models of cancers that are not well represented across the compendium of existing cell lines, and this is being done as, as part of the Human Cancer Models Initiatives funded by NCI. Paralog screens, these are um, screens largely led by Bill Sellers at the Broad, um, knocking out not just single genes, but pairs of genes, particularly paralogs, that often have redundant function. And so you could imagine, for example, that a small molecule might do a good job of identifying two paralogs, related paralogs, whereas individual genetic knockout of either one may not r reveal a phenotype. And so those studies are ongoing. There are a number of in vivo screens um, that are being conducted to identify um, are there vulnerabilities, for example, that look amazing in vitro, but if you could do those studies in vivo systematically, um, could you eliminate false positives? And, or could you actually discover vulnerabilities that are uniquely found in vivo but are missed in vitro, and it looks like there may be some of those uh, as well. And of course, there are always more kinds of omic characterizations and a growing number of cell lines uh, that, one, uh, that one could study. I want to share one vignette uh, that my lab is focused on uh, coming out of the DETMAP project, and that's been uh, focusing on ovarian cancer, which, as you probably know, um, has a real dearth of effective treatments, or at least treatments that give sustained benefit to patients as opposed to um, transient responses, uh, for example, that occur with cisplatin therapy, which is very effective at inducing remissions, but unfortunately often is accompanied by rapid uh, recurrence. And so here, Daniel Bondison, um, as a postdoc in the lab, uh, was interested in asking the question, are there selective dependencies for ovarian cancers um, selectively compared to other lineages, the measure of skew of the data towards ovarian cancer in that way? Without describing this plot in great detail, uh, he was able to show that, in fact, there was one um, protein in particular called XPR1 and a related protein called Kidens220, a previously not particularly well annotated um, protein that were outliers with respect to uh, being ovarian cancer dependencies, but not dependencies elsewhere. So this was interesting. Um, it turns out that XPR1 is an, the single phosphate exporter encoded by mammalian genomes. And we were able to show in experiments that I don't have time to describe today that kidens 220, this previously unannotated protein, is part of an XPR1 complex. And if you have kidens 220 loss of function, you lose this XPR1 um, phosphate export uh, activity as well. So XPR1, that's an interesting, um, and phosphate homeostasis, is that an interesting um, uh, therapeutic target? And are there 
predictive biomarkers beyond the ovarian cancer lineage that might identify XPR1 dependent uh, tumors. And so here we just looked this up on the debt map and said, what's the top predictive biomarker of XPR1 dependency? And it turns out that the, the most predictive molecular feature of XPR1 dependency is a phosphate importer known as SLC34A2. So the dependency is a phosphate exporter. The, its predictive biomarker is a phosphate importer. That's unlikely to uh, be seen by, by chance. It's interesting also that it had been previously established that SLC34A2, the importer, is under the transcriptional regulation of the lineage transcription factor PEX8, which is known to be essential for the survival of ovarian cancer cells and their fallopian tube uh, progenitors. So that with this, you can't dial down um, um, PAX8 transcription factor uh, because it's itself is required for survival. That drives expression of um, the, imp the importer um, SLC34A2. Um, so you can see on the right that for those cancer cell lines that do not have high levels of expression of the importer, SLC34A2, they don't care whether you knock out XPR1 with respect to survival. Whereas in those models where the biomarker is high, you have a high degree of lethality associated with knockout of XPR1, uh, the phosphate uh, exporter. Um, we went on to show that the, um, this predictive biomarker, the importer, 34A2, is highly expressed, uh, shown by immunohistochemistry chemistry on the top panel. And interestingly, also, XPR1 itself is the target of frequent genome amplification in ovarian cancer, suggested that it must, for reasons that we still don't understand, be under some kind of select, positive selective pressure such that you see this, this amplification. And so the model um, that we're working under is that under in normal cells, there's a normal homeostatic balance between the phosphate importer, SLC34A2, and the phosphate exporter, XPR1. In the case of ovarian cancer, because of this PAX8-driven high level of expression of the importer, the cell needs to have a commensurate high level of XPR1 expression in order to compensate for this high phosphate uh, um, influx um, to keep the cell in homeostasis. And so when you then genetically ablate XPR1, the cell collapses because of unopposed phosphate import. And we we're able to show, uh, Daniel was able to show that in fact you do see a accumulation of um, phosphate within the cell leading to that cell death. But here again, we come to another challenging to target therapeutic target. So the biology and the genetics is saying XPR1, that's the thing you should go after for ovarian cancer. But it's a large transmembrane protein. You might say, oh, it's easy to just make an antibody. But these are actually tough antibodies to make. Um, and so how could you go about um, trying to target this with some small molecule strategy? And so here, uh, Daniel Bondison again turned to genetics and functional genomics to um, answer this question and used systematic base editing to tile across the coding sequence of XPR1 and ask which of those mutations were able to rescue XPR1 deficient cells from this cell death phenotype, and which of those mutations were deficient in their rescuing ability. And what he was able to show is shown on the, on the left-hand side, that there are two particular regions denoted A and B um, that are part of XPR1 protein previously described as the so-called SPX domain. And it turns out that these two regions of mutations that resulted in loss of function directly oppose each other on the predicted, uh, the alpha fold structure of, of XPR1 as shown on the right. It also turns out that it had been previously uh, recognized that this XPX uh, domain is involved in binding of inositol pyrophosphates, um, which are the downstream product of um, a couple of enzymes, in particular an, en an enzyme called IP6K. And the binding of these inositol pyrophosphates to the SPX domain results in derepression of XPR1 phosphate export function. 
So this raises the question that if you had an IP6K inhibitor, might it phenocopy XPR1 genetic loss of function that we discovered in the DET map? It turns out that there's a company, um, Scoia Pharmaceuticals in, in Japan, that actually made um, a quite good IP6K inhibitor. Um, so we synthesized that compound and then tested it in a handful of ovarian cancer cell lines, um, some which have the high SLC34A2 biomarker um, and some that do not, and showed that in this limited number of cell lines, at least, that this small molecule, SC919, was able to phenocopy XPR1 loss. At least, you know, a few biomarker high and a few biomarker low um, cell lines. So that's encouraging. But, you know, from a genomicist's perspective, having a few of this and a few of that isn't particularly satisfying. And we'd really like to be able to do is to ask whether that really holds up across the scale of, for example, the DET map. That is, the small, does a small molecule phenocopying the genetic loss hold up across um, the genetic um, diversity encoded in the DET map? And so to do this, um, we turned to a method developed, developed by a postdoc in my lab um, called Channing U, a method that we call PRISM. And this is a very simple idea, which is to say, what if we introduce into different cancer cell lines, now we've barcoded over a thousand of them, a unique molecular barcode randomly integrated into the genome that then would allow you to pool hundreds of cell lines together and then treat with some perturbation of interest, genetic perturbation, a small molecule perturbation, and simply count the barcodes so that if you a particular barcode was depleted, for example, treat, treating with a small molecule, you could infer that the cell line that was tagged with that molecular barcode must have been killed. Simple concept, but means that you can do like 500 experiments at once in an internally controlled way. So again, we call this, this method PRISM. And so here, what we could do is say, all right, let's take the PRISM profile, and we did this with the, uh, just with 250 uh, human cancer cell lines treat with this IP6K inhibitor, SC919, and then simply correlate it to all the existing DETMAP data and ask which of the genetic perturbations, the CRISPR knockout across the entirety of the genome, are best correlated with the growth inhibitory activity of this small molecule. And you get this very dramatic result. So this looks like a line. It's actually a lot of green dots all lined up. Um, and then you get this hockey stick showing that the number one correlate, uh, CRISPR knockout correlate of this small molecule is XPR1, and number two is kittens 220 which, as you may recall, I, we showed was an obligate um, binding partner to XPR1. So this tells you a lot. Um, this tells you that, um, you know, that initially encouraging pattern that we saw that a small molecule now phenocopies and recapitulates the genetic ablation of XPR1 holds up across at least 250 cell lines. So that's good to validate the hypothesis. And it also tells you that this is a very good small molecule to the extent that this is a pretty good test of off-target activity of a compound. Because if you have off-target activity, it often manifest it manifests as a growth inhibitory signal. Um, and we don't see that here because we only see it uh, correlating with genetic knockout of its intended target. So I think we're increasingly using uh, PRISM in this context to validate targets and to credential the selectivity of small molecule inhibitors. Uh, I want to just spend um, one minute. I added this slide in uh, uh, after hearing this, this morning stimulating discussion on Parkinson's disease and Francis's question about alpha-synuclein. Um, and this really isn't ready for presentation, but I put it in anyway. It's a, it's a preliminary result. But just to stimulate you with how we're thinking about, could we use PRISM outside of oncology? Um, and, and that is, um, could we understand the growth inhibitory effect of alpha-synuclein um, by looking at the genetic diversity of these human cancer cell lines. And so we did the following kind of crazy experiment, which is on a lentivirus to take 
uh, an alpha-synuclein um, transgene that encodes a, a human variant, the A53T mutation that is prone to aggregation, introduce that into the panel of 250 cellons and ask, is there differential growth inhibition uh, that is seen across the panel of cell lines? And if so, could we use that to identify models that might be used to study what are the mechanisms by which alpha-synuclein um, induces growth um, inhibition or cell death, which of course is what occurs in the substantia nigra in patients with Parkinson's disease. And so here's just a preliminary result looking at the effect um, at five days or eight days um, following um, transduction of alpha-synuclein across um, the first 250 cell lines. Um, and what you see is very reproducible uh, results and a great diversity of um, the growth inhibitory effect, where the majority of the cell lines don't care, actually, whether you overexpress alpha-synuclein. But then there are these outliers um, towards the bottom, which reproducibly appear to have a growth inhibitory effect of alpha-synuclein uh, expression. And then we could look back at the DETMAP data and ask, what are the predictive biomarkers of having a growth inhibitory response to alpha-synuclein? And I'll just point to one encouraging initial result, uh, which is an outlier, is expression of endogenous alpha-synuclein itself, which I think tends to say that, yes, these are cancer cell lines. They're not primary dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra, but there's something about the biology that we're capturing here. And so as a way to do, for example, genome-wide, initial genome-wide um, uh, modifier screens that would then take a limited number of hypotheses and put them into more physiologically relevant dopaminergic uh, neuron systems, that that's a promising uh, approach uh, to take. Um, that's all I have to say about that. So just a couple of um, final words about um, precision medicine uh, beyond cancer. Um, it's just early days, um, which is kind of exciting to think about where our field is, where the initial bottleneck was, oh, you know, how could you technically accomplish sequencing of a genome or then many genomes? Or then it was technically feasible, but it was too expensive. Now it's neither of those things. And the challenge is now, like, how do we make good use of those data? And I think maybe people here will disagree, but it seems inevitable to me that whole genome sequencing, it's already at about 300 bucks. It's continuing to fall. Whole genome sequencing for everybody is going to be in our future, maybe in the newborn setting, maybe in another setting. That's the world we're going to live in. And we need to figure out how to make the most of that information and how to do this uh, responsibly and to make sure we're learning from um, doing all that sequencing. Because what a disaster it would be if somehow routine whole genome sequencing as part of like the medical record became a thing and we weren't maximally learning from that experience. And so the Broad is, is um, committed to trying to help make sure we're learning maximally from that uh, experience. Um, and so I'll just say here that um, it seems likely that that genetics in the clinic, whole genome sequencing or whatever, I think that's, it will be what it is as opposed to panels of you know, looking for mutant genes or whole exomes, will be a thing. And it will mostly be a thing that is driven by commercial entities, by companies. That's good. Um, they will do a good job um, at this. But we're not poised, just as I said, on the cancer genome side to be learning from those data. Uh, and I think we have a collective responsibility to make sure that we do. Everyone, including the companies, will benefit from sharing those data with the research community because the more we learn about the benefit of, of that sequencing, the more valuable their products um, will become. Uh, but we're not on that path now. Um, and I think that's something we need to figure out. I think there's an important role of the federal government probably in there somewhere to incentivize the sharing of that information and perhaps to even be paying for the sharing of that information um, until and unless we've learned what there is to be learned from large scale uh, information. And we need to be thinking about rather than this sort of firewall between there's research and there's clinical practice getting more to the point where we're learning from routine uh, care of patients. Because you, know, you think about how much information is, is generated in the clinic on a daily basis, it's enormous. 
And when you compare that to what we learn from the clinical experience, that's tiny. And we need to, we need to fix that. So I think my, my last slide um, on delivering on the promise of, of the genome, I think you know, the genome has delivered. It's pretty spectacular. Um, I gave one tiny you know, early example of this uh, uh, fusion um, that, that piqued my interest in the genome. But we now have a mountain of genetic variants strongly associated with disease risk. That's no longer our, our problem, discovering whether those things exist and whether they can be clues to the biological basis of disease. They exist, and they're giving strong clues as, as to that basis. But that just exposes the next challenge that we need to deal with. Um, and that, I think you can sum up by saying, we need to figure out how to target, in a pharmacologic sense, uh, whatever the genome is delivering. And I think there are two components to that. One is we need to figure out how to go from this mountain of variants to a molehill of therapeutic hypotheses, a small number of, of, of hypotheses. If there are a 1,000 genetic variants associated with a particular disease, that's not going to be a 1,000 mechanisms. It's going to be a limited number of, of mechanisms that are consolidated um, from those large number of genetic variants. And I want to make the distinction here from um, uh, um, a, a variant to function kind of effort. That's important, too, to understand what is the biochemical function or the gene regulatory function of a given variant. Here I'm really focusing on what is the biological story that a collection of variants is telling that could be exploited therapeutically. I don't think we know how to do that now. We need to take these same kind of systematic functional genomic approaches and figure that out and get that to the point that it's as regularized as sequencing genomes in the first place. And then having identified whatever those key therapeutic um, programs are or therapeutic opportunities are, we need to get better at figuring out how to make therapeutics that are directed against whatever those data are telling us we need to target. And we can't actually believe that there's such thing as an undruggable target. Whether that's going to mean figuring out clever strategies with small molecules that we haven't figured out, or it's going to be programmable nucleic acid-based therapeutics, we need to figure out how to be able to be systematic with therapeutic discovery, just like we're systematic with genetic and genomic discovery. So uh, I'd like to conclude by uh, just acknowledging the people that have contributed to these projects. Their names are, are on the screen, and I've tried to mention them as I go along. Uh, thank you all very much for your attention, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Dr. Artimi, can I start? No, Charles. Is it okay if I ask? Yeah, okay, yeah. I don't want to step on your toes and not have you call no, on no, me. Please, oh, okay. Thank you. Todd, that was, that was terrific. First of all, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for spending the whole day with us. I know you've met with various people. I think you had lunch with trainees and so forth. So um, it's wonderful to have you uh, head of the Broad here visiting for all day. I have to admit, I had no idea you were going to be here first thing this morning, so I had no idea that you were going to see me um, dressed the way I was, which, which leads me to my first of two questions. What is the most embarrassing costume ever worn by the head of the Broad Institute? Now, this could either be you or your predecessor, but what's the most embarrassing costume? Well, uh, I think it's yet to be worn. And you, 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 you told I, me, okay. Eric, that it was. So if you want to, uh, that... for, for half price, I will sell you the entire Ken garb, and you can impress the staff tomorrow when okay. you go back. I'll take you up on that. Thank okay, you. there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, serious question, though, because it relates to both the previous session with the patient and also a question that came up, and then you even touched on it. You know, one of the questions that I think a lot of folks ask when they hear a presentation from, that we heard earlier or hear cancer genomicists talk about liquid biopsies is, you know, why is it not routine? Why isn't it everybody getting blah, blah, blah? And I think the more we see it in a non-invasive prenatal setting where it's clear this can be done for prenatal screening, why is it not done for cancer? You gave one argument, which I know is legit, about sensitivity issues. But in your position, your expertise, do you think 
sort of looking ahead five, 10 years? I mean, you, you sort of are very confident about we're all gonna get our genome sequenced, if not at birth at some time. Do you think liquid biopsy screening for cancer is gonna become routine? And if so, you sort of see it in the five or 10 year window or longer? Yeah, so um, I don't know is the honest answer. I think that, so I alluded to the technical challenge of sensitivity, but let's just imagine the somehow the sensitivity um, uh, challenge is addressed but through some technical solution. It, it's still not obvious to me that actually screening healthy populations for cancer is the right thing to do. I suspect that if you made a super sensitive test, you'd find a lot of cancer out there, much of which may not actually you know, contribute to the demise of individuals. So I think at a population level, particularly patients that aren't at, otherwise at risk, either genetically or because of exposures, I'm not sure that um, that kind of blood biopsy-based um, uh, screening for cancer is what we should be doing. I don't know. Studies still need to be done. And we have this technical challenge of they're now pretty good at detecting advanced cancers, but not so good at earlier cancers. So it's a bit moot. But I, I'm still a little skeptical. Okay. Francis. Todd, that was a great talk. And thank you for being here for the Trent Lecture. I want to ask a bit of a technical question about PRISM. You had to barcode all of those cell lines in order to be able to determine what happens in terms of their survival after some kind of intervention, a treatment, a drug. Steve McCarroll has this alternative of the cell village where you don't have to barcode your cell lines. You do have to know their genotypes. And then basically at the end of your treatment, you simply look to see with very low pass sequencing who's still there, because uh, you can deduce that uh, with appropriate uh, informatic approach. Uh, if one was trying to do this experiment and didn't want to bother with the barcodes, it would seem like that was an alternative strategy, although maybe it's a little more complicated and a little more expensive. Just, do you have any comment about the difference between the PRISM approach and the Cell Village approach? Yeah, so um, we've shown that actually you can do the detection just with endogenous genetic variations. You don't need the barcodes. Having a short barcode that you can PCR amplify and do a trivial amount of sequencing, the cost does matter, particularly if you're gonna sequence across thousands of small molecules and many doses and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and their you know, copy number variation in cancer cell lines can make it a little more complicated. Um, but it, it may be that you know, if, if sequencing costs continue to, to drop, you may not need the barcodes at all. And um, you know, it does introduce an additional step and maybe some selection uh, when you're putting them through um, you know, drug selection to insert the barcode. So yeah, it's possible. Got it. And I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So you gave us a very, very wonderful presentation and telling us genomics is helping us to understand the root causes of disease. My question is, Yes, but not everybody that carries these alterations will develop cancer. So how do we bring the other aspect of the things that determine human susceptibility to disease within this framework of genomics? And my second question is, you said the federal government may have a role to play in incentivizing businesses. How do we do that? Do you have some examples that could be useful? Um, so, first, um, with respect to cancer development risk, most of what I focused on was focused on the somatic genome, not on the germline, because it's certainly the case that not everyone with germline risk variants um, uh, will develop cancer. Those are interesting populations, however, for example, if one were to do non-invasive blood biopsy type monitoring for patients, um, who are known to have genetic risk, that's an interesting uh, patient population um, to focus on uh, and to study environmental exposure um, in, the, in, that, in that context, or people that have an environmental risk, like um, smokers, um, as, as an example. Then with respect to um, you know, incentives, I'm, you know, th this is outside of my, my area of expertise, to be sure, but, you know, I'd like to see, for example, what if, what if a condition of reimbursement to companies um, for their tests, obviously you can't require that patients share their data, but you could require of companies that 
they ask patients if they wish to share their data, and then patients should decide um, whether they wish to share. Um, I've spoken to many companies, uh, as a second point, that are saying, we don't object to, sh to sharing data and making it freely all of our this data if there's informed consent with the community, but it doesn't make sense for it to be our financial obligation to do that. That's not the business we're in. So if there is a mechanism for you know, federal dollars to support the ingestion of those data from the commercial world where there's informed consent and to store it and make it available to the research community, that would create uh, the feasibility of data sharing uh, where there's not like a philosophical objection to it today. Hi, thanks for coming, an excellent talk. Um, you made some very important points toward the end of your talk about, as you just did now, sharing the data and, and having an you know, institutional and genomic learning health system. Um, I'm wondering, we're seeing a lot of the barriers to doing this actually within institutions and concerns about HIPAA and other things, um, and, and even greater barriers about sharing across institutions. So have, do you have any experience with trying to do this in one of the, you know, man's greatest hospital and, and that uh, in your system, and, and how have you overcome those barriers? Yeah, it, it's, it remains a challenge, but it's getting better. I think as the scale increases, you know, I think institutions are seeing that actually the number of patients that they have in their private biobanks is tiny compared to all of us or the UK Biobank, for example. And so the notion that by hoarding, hoarding your samples and data, you're gonna somehow have a competitive advantage, I think that's going away. There are still legal concerns around ensuring that appropriate consent to share and so on is there. There are technical challenges of how do you make the data actually freely available. But I think this, um, we're moving out of the era of institutions wanting to hoard the data because they see it as a competitive advantage. Having the patients is a competitive advantage, but the data, I think, shouldn't be monetized, shouldn't be, shouldn't be hoarded. And I think the availability of um, you know, NLP methods and other types of methods making it possible to extract value out of clinical data in whatever form it happens to reside, I think that's making that better as well. And then lastly, I think there was some hiding behind HIPAA as if HIPAA was there in, in a way to prevent hospitals from sharing data when in fact it was there to guarantee the ability of patients to be able to take their data with them. I think that's going away too. So I think, that's, I think that problem's gonna get better even if it's not solved today. Great, thanks. So we take one more question. Thank you for your talk. It was very interesting and very educational for me. Um, I was just wondering if you envision integration of um, AI or machine learning in cancer genomics, and do you think this will accelerate treatment in general? I mean, it's hard to think of areas, new areas of science that are more exciting than the intersection of AI and biology. I think it's one of the new areas of focus at the Broad. I will say that um, I think a big challenge there is understanding like what are the right questions really to be asking of these powerful methods, because um, I think most biologists, whether they're cancer biologists or whatever biologists, don't understand enough about these methods to really use them in sensible ways or even to invent, you know, make them better. And most computer scientists that aren't trained in biology don't really know what the right, most exciting and important and tractable questions are. So there's a bit of a language barrier at the moment. And so I think where we need to focus on is those disciplines coming together and jointly defining, okay, in 2023, what are the questions that are just out of range today, but not just fantasy thinking? And what are the data that we need to answer those questions? And if we don't own the data today, let's generate them. I think that's the path that we need to go on. I think either the biologist using off the shelf methods or computer scientists expecting that the biology will come automatically I don't think either one alone is going to get there. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone very much.